Yeah. Thanks for uh, for joining us today. I, I thought what we'd do is start with a brief update of where we're at on all of our development activities, and we'll leave some time for Q and A at the end. Um, we formed up the Airplane Development Organization uh, a little over two years ago with a focus on deploying a single management system across all of our development efforts to standardize the way we develop airplanes, allowing us to not just share practices amongst all of our development activities, but to share resources and to migrate to a true, common, single management system. We've made great progress at, at doing that, and I, and I think that in a large way, uh, it's allowed us to inject stability and restore confidence in our ability to develop new airplanes. Now this management system was first deployed from beginning to end on 787-9, an airplane that we were able to deliver to our customers a month ahead of our, our commitments to them and, and an airplane that meets all of the technical performance commitments that we made to our customers. And we've continued to use this management system across all of our development activities. Maybe to give you a sense for where our focus is, we could go through one or two charts. Let's go to the first chart. You know, this really sums up what our mission is in airplane development. First, meet our customers' expectations. That's not just around how far the airplane flies, how many seats it has, how much gas it burns, uh, what sort of emissions it has from an environmental sensitivity and responsibility standpoint. But it's also from a reliability, maintainability perspective as well. Our customers need to know the airplanes we're developing will do what we say they will do. That was our focus with the 787-9 uh, and we delivered on those expectations. Uh, the other thing is to deliver value. Now there are two ways to think about value here. One is value to our customers. So they can use this as a tool to implement their business models wherever they're at in the world to drive profitability, and to provide the service to their customers that they desire. But there's a second aspect of this as well, and that's for, to deliver value to our own production system. Our job is to design airplanes that are simple to, uh, to uh, build, to assemble as well. And if it's, they're simple to build and assemble, it will drive our productivity and it will drive our quality. The higher our productivity, the higher our quality, the better we're able to service the needs in the marketplace. And finally, to reduce risk. Reduce risk to Boeing in our development efforts and our commitments to our shareholders and our employees, and to reduce the risk our customers perceive in our ability to deliver on our commitments. And again, that, that uh, groundwork we laid with the 787-9 is serving as well here. Let's go on to the next chart. Talk a little bit about uh, where our focus is in the design process and how we're thinking about innovation these days. I just mentioned one of them, simplicity. The simpler our products are, the easier they'll be to maintain, the easier they'll be to operate. The simpler our products are, the easier they will be to produce with the productivity and quality that we're looking for. So it's really about simplicity, it's about pr producibility, it's about reliability in the designs uh, that we're producing uh, on the new airplanes. So let's move in and talk about each one of the airplanes. We'll kind of go through sequentially uh, the airplanes as they're going to market over the next couple of years. And we'll start with the mass on the next chart. We're really excited about, about this airplane. 8% more fuel efficient than the, the NEO, more range than the NEO, uh, 12 more seats in the heart of the market where it really matters. Uh, the other thing that you know we don't talk a lot about, but it's very uh, relevant here, is the Boeing Sky Interior. How many, how many of you have flown on a, a, a Boeing Sky Interior? It's really a neat experience. LED lighting, openness, spaciousness. We took everything we learned from the 787 experience on designing interiors and applied it to the Sky Interior. It becomes standard on the max. So customers around the world will be able to utilize this new generation of interior for a narrow body airplane to better serve their, their customers. And obviously the airplane is the highest, uh, most reliable uh, in its class. Now, we can't have a big group like this without some entertainment. So we're gonna roll a video here that I hope you really enjoy it. It'll do most of my job in briefing the rest of the max. Go right ahead.
exceptional airline. It takes optimizing routes, fares, <coughs> the team, and minimizing costs everywhere. Succeed and you can celebrate, have a little fun. Um, not that much fun. Let's get back to work. Back to your sweet spot, where you're in the zone. Your airline's core business. That's where you excel, and your decisions have the biggest impact. So you invest in that core, build it up, lock it in for the future. How? With 12 people, loyal business travelers, some grandparents, and a handful of people on holiday. How do you get those 12 more people? Um, no, that can't fit 12 more people. And maybe those were big in the 80s, but so was this, and that, and, whoa. You need something designed to make even more of your airline's future. Something for your core business. Something that seats 12 more people than any other choice, without costing you more to fly. How much more? Zero. Zip. Nada. That's the new 737 MAX. So what do you get with the new 737 MAX and 12 more people? Let's do some math. <laughs> no. Fun math. Money math. For example, take one shiny new 737 MAX airplane, plus your 12 more people. Say your airplane flies this many flights per day, every day, for 12 months, at this fair. Even at that fair, that's a lot of revenue. Let's make you more money. Take your same 12 people on all those flights per year, add about 20% for ancillary revenue, boom, more money. Can you realize any of that revenue without the 737 max? Nope. You won't have those 12 people. But you may say, I'm in the low-cost airline business. No problem. Our engineers came up with something just for you. This is the new 737 MAX 200. It seats 200 passengers. Again, 12 more than the other choice. and uses 20% less fuel per seat than today's 737 800. 20% less. You can do amazing things for your business with the new 737 MAX. Okay, can't do that. Impressive, don't you think? Our experts certainly think so. And a lot of business leaders from around the world do too. Because they know the 737 MAX is in the sweet spot for creating airlines of the future. The most successful airlines. Isn't it amazing what 12 people can do for you? So let's go on to the next, next chart. So where are we at in the development? Now, i, I got to warn you. Uh, when I status each one of the programs, the story is going to be the same. Every one of our development programs is on track. On track from a schedule perspective, on track from a performance perspective. So you're going to hear a little repetition here. Airplane here, on track. 90% drawing release. Now that's the milestone we use to say that the vast majority of the design is done. We can move deeply into producing the airplanes with confidence that the engineering isn't going to change the design. That's key to allowing us to get the EI yeah, get into flight test, into EIS, meeting our customers' commitments on schedule. Ninety percent drawing release on this airplane occurred ahead of schedule, ahead of what we planned. Uh, the engine development is on track. Now, I know there's been some press recently about the 1B and performance issues and blah blah blah. Quite frankly, we don't know where that's coming from. This engine is doing exactly what we needed to do. In fact, maybe even a little bit better. So we feel really good about the uh, about the engine. Uh, it's not just about the Max 8, it's about the 9, it's about the 7, and it's about the 200. All four models are being developed concurrently by the same engineering team. There are different phases of their development, but it's all going on concurrently, all on track. Uh, we loaded the uh, first wing on the exact day that we had planned years ago. We're uh, beginning to assemble the airplane and the assembly of the first airplane is uh, occurring on track and we're well well into uh, pulling together the uh, low rate initial production line that the MAX will begin uh, production on. Next chart. Uh, you can kind of see where this low rate initial production line will, will be. Uh, spar load, as I mentioned, was uh, on time. Uh, automated wing panel assembly is going very well. Again, just as we had planned. Once again, the keyword here is on track. Next chart, uh, 2017 is the first delivery for this airplane. Uh, we feel good about the de delivery date. I've got positive uh, schedule margin against that date. Uh, once again, on track for the, uh, the schedule. Next chart, so bottom line, we got a great family of airplanes here. Now, it's one thing I do want to address around the max. I know there's a lot of questions around uh, A321, uh, Max 9, 
the way to think about this is not Max 9A321. It's not Max 8A321. It's about two families of airplanes. Families that bring capabilities to our customers. And our customers assess those capabilities to determine what is the best match to their business model, their network structure, their growth strategies. Now, since we define the max to the marketplace, since airlines knew clearly what their choice was between the max and the neo, it's been a 50-50 split with the market. So I know there are a lot of questions about one model versus another, blah, blah, blah. The facts are really clear. The market is getting split 50-50. And we're going to continue to compete for every airplane sale that's out there. We're going to compete aggressively. But the data says it's a 50-50 split to date. All the data says the heart of the market is around the max 8 size airplane. We like our family. We like the positioning of that family. We'll continue to compete. And oh, by the way, we'll continue to evolve as we see market conditions evolve. That's where the max 200 came from. Let's go on to the next chart. I'd like to talk a little bit about 77-10. Uh, now I know many of you know the story here. Uh, we had the max or the uh, 879 uh, inflow, and we asked ourselves a simple question: What if airlines cared more about efficiency than range? We looked at the 879, did a simple stretch to it, about 15% more passengers, didn't change the max takeoff weight of the airplane allowed the range to come down. And what did we end up with? An, an airplane with amazing economics and an airplane with the range to cover over 90% of wide body route structures around the world. We took it to our customers and they loved it. So we went forward with the airplane. Now we're progressing rapidly with the design. That 90% drawing release I talked about on the MAX uh, a few minutes ago, we're gonna hit that on this airplane later this year and all of our statistics around the stability of the design are exactly what we expected. Engineering running ahead of schedule, heading toward that 90% drawing release. The same thing we saw with the 87-9, uh, the same thing we saw with the MAX development. Now, talk about economics on this airplane. You can kind of see some numbers up here. Let's go back and chart. You can kind of see some numbers up here. 30% better, better fuel per seat than the A330. That's a big chunk of efficiency. And even the A350, 10% better fuel. This is an airplane that our customers realize have out, has outstanding economics and outstanding flexibility. It's going to be a great growth airplane for many airlines around the world. Now the other thing we're doing here is maximizing commonality. Now from a Boeing perspective, that's important. It allows us to produce this airplane in our production system uh, with mechanics not really caring what minor models coming down the production line. So think about this. If you're a mechanic and you're building one airplane one day and then we flow the line and another minor model comes down the line and it's the work statement is different, the parts are different, the build plan is different, <coughs> what happens to your efficiency? It's not going to be as good as if you were building the same with the said it's it's on track building on the dash nine success the engine for, uh, development uh, the <coughs> en engine uh, that Rolls-Royce is doing for uh, this airplane is progressing uh, very well of course GE's already got a model uh, an engine model that uh, addresses that I mentioned critical design review and uh, detailed design complete before the end of the year so uh, and uh, let's go on to the next chart talk a little bit about the production system uh, this airplane will be built at our, our Charleston, South Carolina plant. Uh, that plant is preparing for the introduction of this airplane. Uh, you can kind of read some of the pictures up here and you can read, read some of the data. I will tell you though that 
when we introduced the 787-9 into our Charleston plant, it went very, very well. Internally, our numbers were exactly in the range that we expected for the introduction of a new model. This model will have even less disruption because of its high degree of commonality. So we were able to seamlessly introduce the Dash 9 into the production system down there, and we think this introduction will go even more smoothly than that. Next chart. Uh, on track for first delivery in 2018, like all of our airplanes in development, we've got positive schedule margin against our commitments to our customers. Uh, we continue to work uh, the airplanes on track or ahead of schedule, and again, performance on this airplane is exactly where we thought it would be. Next chart. So bottom line, a great growth opportunity for airlines flying the 8-7 today. Start with an 8, move up to a 9, greater flexibility with the 10. Uh, airlines are really beginning to learn how to use this uh, airplane in their fleet structures as well. We're working with many airlines who have either decided on the airplane or are contemplating the airplane. And the flexibility it brings to their route, route structures is really intriguing to many of them. Uh, so we're really excited about that. And again, this is an efficiency play. You saw some of the numbers earlier. Next uh, chart, 777X. Now once again, a little bit of the, the story here. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were asking ourselves, how can we take the investments we've made in technology over the last decade Wing we know how to design and build. And we stretched it to turn 35 feet. Same material system, same structural architecture, same team doing the detailed design. We put a wing fold on the airplane so it would fit in every gate a 777 fits in today. Put a new GE engine on it. Took the interiors from the 787, applied it to this airplane sculpted the frames to get larger interior dimensions, larger windows, and we've even achieved the same cabin altitude advantages of the 787 on this airplane. In other words, we're replicating that passenger experience on the 777 that passengers love about the 787. That's what the 777X is all about. 12% uh, more efficient than the A350-1000. Even the 8X, is more efficient at every range than its most direct competitor, the A350-1000. Greater payload range capability, greater flexibility. And then the Dash 9, with around 412 seats, 8,000 nautical <laughs> mile range, and amazing economics, the customers have loved it. That's why this airplane, since its introduction, has outsold the competition two to one. In fact, if you stack up the uh, 300ER and this airplane against the A350-1000, we've outsold the air that airplane five to one. So we've got a great airplane in the, the 300ER today. We're going to have an even greater airplane with the 777X. Next chart. Where are we at? On track, once again. Performance is exactly where we want it to be. Schedule is exactly where we want it to be. We will enter detailed design uh, later this summer, um, allowing our engineers to go forward rapidly uh, with the detailed design of the airplane. Now, key to us is having stable requirements going into this time frame. So the engineers know exactly what they need to design. They're not chasing performance. They're not chasing capability. The requirements on the airplane have been very stable over the last year, and that's allowed us to accelerate certain aspects of the design, especially around systems. Our objective here is to design the systems uh, <coughs> much earlier than before, allowing us to mature them more rapidly than before, ensuring an even more reliable airplane at entry into service. And you can see a couple of the other
be installing a new set of auto plates in the new building later this year. Those auto plates will be 120 feet down in length, and very likely some of the largest auto plates in the world. But that near full scale prototyping of the wing, and it's not just about the panel, it's about the entire structure. The design of automation for assembly of the, uh, the wing uh, and improving out those uh, key aspects of the production system and giving us confidence that we've got the right design details much earlier than in the past. The other thing you see is the, the building that's going in for the, the composite wing. This is at our Everett um, site uh, in Seattle. Many of you have been there before. The building will be about a million and a quarter square feet. That's actually the view from my office. So it's really kind of a neat, neat deal. I get you know, a few days a month I'm in my office, I actually get to see the building going up. And it's amazing how much it changes every time I'm in my office. It's going up very, very rapidly. So production system coming together very well for the, for the airplane. Next chart. A uh, little bit more about the, the production system. On track with the uh, construction, first autoclaves in the, the third quarter. Um, building to be done in May. You know, the other thing that we're doing is utilizing the enterprise to a great extent in the design of the, the 777X as well. Uh, the center wing box uh, will be done, will be uh, fabricated and assembled in Everett, and then the final assembly of the wing will be in Everett. But the edges of the wing will actually be done at our, our St. Louis facility and designed by engineers in our St. Louis facility. And, and you can kind of see a, the beginnings of the construction there and, and what it will finally look like in St. Louis six autoclaves going uh, into that facility to support uh, the design of those uh, those parts and building those parts. Next chart. Once again, on schedule for first delivery in 2020. As I said before, we have schedule margin and are uh, working well ahead of schedule on this airplane as well. Uh, once again, it's kind of a boring message. On track for performance, on track for schedule. Next chart. So, with the 777X, we've got a great airplane in the 300ER. We've got an airplane that's a truly worthy successor to that airplane in the 777X. Building on the legacy uh, that that airplane has built over the years, the 300ER, and improving it even further. Greater efficiency, greater network flexibility for our customers. It's going to be an amazing tool for our customers in executing their business plans uh, around the world. Next chart. And with that, you can kind of read the summary, and I think we're ready for some for some questions. Uh, one question to this to this X to just mention that first you have this foldable wing option. Is it an option or is it something to, to every aircraft? The wing fold yes. is basic basic to the airplane. They will get every aircraft. Every aircraft. Yes. Okay. And second question just mentioned that it actually took over many features of the 787, like cabin altitude. I was wondering, even the windows, I think, is are bigger than the 787 yes. size. I was wondering how we were actually doing that in an aluminum airframe rather than in the carbon carbon. Yeah, we get that question a lot. Um, the, uh, we are replicating the cabin altitude of the 787. Uh, the windows are larger than the 777 windows today. They're not quite as large okay. as the 787 windows. You can kind of think of them as being uh, half in between. There's an interesting fact, though. The frame spacing on the 777 is narrower than it is on the 87, so that you have more windows per unit length. We actually have more exterior light coming into the 777X than we do the 787. So that sense of the outside coming in is even greater on the uh, 777X than it is on the 787. So how do we do it? Uh, good, hard, <coughs> is the bottom line. We understand the 777 fuselage from an engineering strength and fatigue perspective very well. We know how much structural margin it has. We knew what areas we needed to beef up in order to be able to support the uh, lower cabin altitude. Uh, we worked the equation through a series of design trades and for very modest investment, we're able to achieve our objective of getting the lower cabin altitude. But it's not humidity the same as in the 787, right? That's the difference. Uh, humidity on this airplane actually will be higher than the current 777. Won't be quite to the levels of the 787, but uh, but it will be higher. So the, the interesting thing here is that uh, you can think about any individual feature between the 777X and the 787, and they'll be slightly different. 
The windows are a little bit smaller, but they're more oven, so greater uh, exterior light coming in. A little bit difference in humidity, slight differences in cabin altitude. What customers notice about the 787 is not these individual features. It's how they all integrate together. It's the total experience that they really notice. So we're replicating that experience with this airplane. Now, the individual parameters will vary a little bit, but for a customer, flying customer, remember the flying public, you'll have that same experience that you have in the 787. What's the difference in cabin altitude between the two? Negligible. We'll take one in the back. Okay, uh, with the same material system for the fuselage? As what? As the present. Yes. Okay. Yes, same material system. Same material though? Yes. Yeah. So, straight yeah, aluminum? Yeah, and so don't, um, don't uh, we are always looking at new material systems. The way we introduce new material systems is through uh, a crawl, walk, and run sort of process. So we'll introduce new materials for individual piece <coughs> parts, and then we'll start to expand. Think about the 787. Why did we have confidence to do all the composites on the 787? Because we've been building composite empennages on the 777 for a long time. So we began there in groups. So the same thing here, John. We will, you'll see us uh, using start cutting them in first at small scale and then going to large scale. A great example is the Eco Demonstrator that's currently flying. The uh, center aisle stand in the uh, cockpit is actually 3D printed from recycled 787 composite material. We took uh, waste materials out of the 787 production system, recycled them, and built a 3D uh, aisle stand. Great example of how you experiment with at a, a small manageable scale and then begin scaling up in an orderly fashion over time. What's the idle stand again? See, idle stand sits between the, um, the, the pilot and co-pilot seat. The aisle stand is what we refer to as. Okay. Uh, so it's got on the lead engine for the 78710. Uh, how close are you to knowing which one would be first off the market program? And uh, coming close to that session, I know it's probably a market driven yeah, it's a, it's a customer-driven decision. Uh, once customers make a decision, then that'll be the, the, the lead engine. And I don't know, I apologize, I don't believe we've said publicly to date which one it's going to be, and I don't think we're ready to. So I apologize for that. We know. But, we do know. But, but. One more. On the 777-8, uh, there's a little bit of a difference between the engine and the 133 inch. No, not just. The, engine, the baseline engine was set two years ago, I think, <laughs> it hasn't changed since. Early in the design, we saw some iteration. The basic engine uh, fan diameter hasn't changed in a couple of years. And the thrust has stayed the same? I'm sorry? The thrust is still the same? Uh, thrust hasn't changed for quite a while. What, a year and a half, two years. I, I'm So long, I don't even remember. Okay, so it's 105. One, yeah. Maximum throws out is that BET or normal? Is that a BET figure? Oh, I'll cut my head, I don't thrust. remember. I'm, I'm sorry, what? Is it Boeing equivalent thrust or is it a standard uh, sea level takeoff figure? We can get, could, could we, we, we'll get the details for you. Okay. <coughs> 